my name is Miguel Myers. Welcome to My Horror Confessional, where every week I will have a guest come on and talk about one classic horror movie that they haven't seen and why. We'll discuss the movie, the actors, and probably get off topic quite a bit. Once I believe they have properly atoned, I will absolve them of their horror movie sin. Today, we have Laurel Hightower. Laurel is an author who has written Whispers in the Dark, Crossroads, and the forthcoming Below, coming soon from Ghoulish Books. She's also been in numerous horror anthologies, the latest being A Woman Built by Man, which was just released last week. She's also a fan of horror movies and true life ghost stories. Laurel, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Can you tell me a little bit about the book that you have coming out from Max Booth's Ghoulish Books? Yeah. So Below is, it's a novella um, and it's kind of my take on the whole Mothman legend. Um, so it's, it's kind of follows the main character, Addy, who um, takes a, a very poorly planned solo trip, which was inspired my, by my own solo trip to Scares That Care last year, which um, I loved the convention and I'll be flying this year because it was a terrifying solo drive. Um, and yeah, so she kind of she kind of teams up with somebody who helps her and then has to decide how far she's willing to go to help him or whether she's going to leave him to his doom. Okay, nice. What I typically ask my guests here is, what is their history with horror? Um, did you grow up liking it? Did you grow up hating it? Um, you know, did you watch? Did you watch with your family or friends? That that sort of thing. I, I think I always loved it. Um, you know, I don't have any clear recollection of like being very tiny and and reading anything with it. But uh, I just always remember going to the library. You know, when I was little, and I would just pull every book off that had the little ghost on the spine, and just you know bring like a huge stack of them. Um, and I, I feel like one of my, I don't know, sort of seminal memories with, with horror and Halloween all, and all of that is that I just remember like one fall, like coming out of the library and there's, it's, you know, getting dark cause it's autumn and there's these leaves swirling, you know, and it's sort of like a little bit lonely and ominous there. And then we got home and like dug out the Halloween decorations and me and my brother and sister like decorated by ourselves for the first time. And I was like, I was like, oh, we can sort of bring on this feeling. I love it. So I just kind of have been, have been continuing to follow that, that feeling most of my life. Nice. That's awesome. Did it manifest itself in, in, in uh, horror movies as well? Did you grow up watching those or, or not? I did. Um, and we were allowed to watch a lot of things, um, which I think is a common theme with uh, people in this community is like, I had no business watching that at the age of five. Um, I don't, I, I remember, I remember like, you know, like Blockbuster when you go through and you've got those, you know, the covers that are so intriguing. Um, and I think we mostly just didn't rent horror because no one else wanted to watch it. Like it was, you know, everyone kind of had to agree on it and, and no one else wanted to watch Ghoulies, but they get you in the end. It was so funny. Plus that creepy thing coming out of the toilet. Like, you know, how could you not be drawn yeah. to that? Um, and, uh, and I, I, I remember mostly we were very limited on the amount of time we were allowed to spend watching television at all. We had like an hour a day. So, you know, and I had to share with my siblings so that there was just, I didn't get a lot of chance to watch them. Um, but I remember watching uh, Leprechaun at a friend's like sleepover when I was about nice. 10 and just being like, I have arrived. I've been dying for this moment. <laughs> like you, our, our girl, Jennifer Aniston in that one. Exactly. Yes. And it was, it was really everything I wanted it to be. It was amazing. Awesome. So what was the horror that attracted the, the, like the horror movies that attracted to you when you were younger, as opposed to what you think attracts you now? And is there any difference in that? I think when I was younger, um, it was, it was those covers and it was like the idea of whatever creature, you know, was on there. Um, I remember watching, so like gremlins didn't bother me. Uh, gremlins mm -hmm. too, especially, I think we watched that more often for some reason. It didn't bother me. Critters did. Um, just cause I remember them rolling over and just leaving a skeleton. And I was like, <laughs> that's horrifying. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, I, I just remember when I was a kid, it was my brother and sister and I actually were all like this. We wanted to watch Child's Play. Um, and we just called it Chucky, you know, because we knew that was the name of the doll. We were just like, we want to watch Chucky, we want to watch Chucky. And for some reason, my parents were just like, no, hard pass. Probably because they didn't want to watch it, which is fair. Um, and uh, 
I think I mentioned this one on, you know, one other podcast one time, but it was like, we went to um, my aunt's house and, and, you know, we were going to watch a movie or something. And she's like, what do you guys want to watch? And I'm like, do you have Chucky? And she's like, yeah, I've got all the Chuckies. I mean, we're losing our minds, right? We're like, it's going to happen. It's finally going to happen. Yeah. And we get all set up and, and you know, all this kind of stuff. And I remember hearing a conversation between my mom and my aunt, like, asking about the violence. And she's like, no, he just does a lot of, like, kicking people and beating them. I'm like, I don't – I think there's a knife involved. But <laughs> ended up being Chuck Norris. And I've never – I mean, uh, I think no. I probably <laughs> – ranks among the top disappointments of my life like to, to oh. date really personally mr kwan i think your food is great <laughs> don't you i didn't hear you yeah yeah i'm gonna get the hell out of here thanks When he left the table, didn't you say he wasn't going to fight? I didn't fight. I gave a motivational seminar. <laughs> yeah. Well, to be, yeah, I mean, it just depends on what you thought about 80s actions or horror movies. Because it could have been like some some biblical, like really bad art, you know, cartoon for kids or something like that. But it was it was not child's play and therefore <laughs> it was we i think we all just sort of like stormed out of the room you know we were very small i'm sure they didn't even know why and we're just like that's it we're mad we're on strike so at this point had you seen it and you wanted to see it again or you hadn't even seen it we hadn't seen it i'm oh, trying okay. to think and i think it because i'm i remain incredibly far behind on the movies that I've watched and honestly even heard of, like, and that's not because I'm like, oh, I'm such a, you know, this Zen person and I only read. It's like, no, I, I just, I never get control of my own television, like, ever. I still get an hour a week now at this point. So I'm always just like so behind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we just, we hadn't watched it then. Um, and now I think it's more like, I just get drawn very much to like the supernatural spookiness rather than like a slashery aspect of something. Like I definitely have some slashers I love. I don't, you know, eschew them or anything, but I, I get pulled in by more of like a creepy ominous feeling like, um, and I always get it mixed up, whether it's the dark and the wicked or the wicked and the dark, but just the whole atmosphere for that one, like that, that's just, I don't know. It's, it's so, um, it just pulls you in so much. It gives you that just delicious feeling of like, this is, this is going to be creepy. Nice. So when it came time to, to start, I'm not a writer, so excuse any ignorance when it comes to these questions, but when it came, when it came time for you to start writing something that you, you, you wanted to do, did you, did you default to horror or Absolutely. did you write? Okay. And yeah. so, so you defaulted to horror. And what do you what do you think it, it is about the genre that calls you, to you to write horror? I think initially um, I was going by the adage of, you know, uh, if you can't find what you want to read, you write it, you know. And um, I was uh, – I had not yet found the indie writing community. So I'm like, wow, there's like five horror authors in the world. This sucks. <laughs> you know, there's, <laughs> there's nobody. And I want more ghost stories. So – I'm going to write a ghost story, but also have a SWAT sniper. I don't, you know, (laughs) it just, it it was like kind of a mishmash. And um, so, so yeah, that was kind of where I started with it was, uh, you know, I I want some ghosts. I want some family involvement. I want to, you know, include all these characters and do all this stuff. Um, And it, because it was just, it was what I wanted to read. And then uh, shortly after that came out, I really started exploring indie publishing or, you know, the indie uh, publishing world and, and like all these great indie publications and everything and, and really realizing like, wow, this as a genre has so much breadth to express just, I mean, like the range of human emotion, you know, and, and really seeing like what people can accomplish with horror, what, you know, um, quiet horror and grief horror and uh, slashers and body horror and um, cosmic horror and all these things I didn't even know existed. And so now it's like, I especially feel like I've, I feel like, especially after I've written below, like, I don't think that apparently anything, anything, anything I try to write, I'm going to end up, there's going to be some feminist elements of it. Just, and I think it's just because 
that's just my experience of the world and I want my characters to be authentic. And so what they feel has a lot to do with the way I experience things, you know? So not in the sense of like, sometimes I'll call it feminine horror because it's not, I don't feel like it's political. I don't feel like it's like preachy or anything. I think it's more like, Hey, here's a lens on how we see the world as women. And like, for example, with below traveling alone as a woman is a, is a very different prospect. Um, and that simply, it's impossible to not have that affect how that story comes out. The cover for Below is fucking insane. What what did you feel like when, when you saw that? Or maybe were you involved in the process or was it a surprise to you? I don't know how publishing works at all, so, <laughs> so please forgive me. Um, it, was, it a, was the cover a surprise to you? Um, only in the sense that, like, this was, I have been inordinately lucky in my covers. I don't know what special star I was writing under, you know, one day, but I've, I've, I'm in, I've loved all my covers um, and below. It was just funny. I think Max um, found that before I'd even sent him the full story because I had touched base with him and just told him, here's what I'm working on. I've written the draft. I'm just doing some polishing. I can get it to you in a couple of weeks, but I've got a Mothman kind of thing. And there's a little bit of elements of like the descent and he was like, yeah, no, I'd like to take a look. And like, while I was still working on it, like a week later, he sends me this. He's like, what do you think about this cover? And I'm like, oh my God, if I wasn't motivated before, I am now. So, and it was such a, I mean, first of all, I love it. I, I wouldn't have cared if it was a totally no-name hermit who created that. But it was Trevor Henderson. And it was so savvy on Max's part because there are so many people who are excited about this they don't know Max, they don't know me, they're thrilled because it's Trevor. And to me, that's like such a great like business move too, because it's like, hey, you know, let's let's get all sort of realms of people excited about this. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm I'm in love with that cover. I'm as soon as I get five free minutes, I'm gonna go get it tattooed on me somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll have to ask, let, let's keep the Max slander or Max involvement because he's no, I'm just kidding. He's a good friend. I just want to give him shit. <laughs> but yeah. You don't uh, mention Max on this show. <laughs> this is a no Max zone. <laughs> um, but but yeah, when I saw the cover, uh, so I think he might have revealed it to you. And then I think a couple minutes before he was going to post it on, on Twitter, he like sent it uh, to us in the group chat that we have. And I was like, holy shit. And it was funny because like my, my, my life was just surrounded by Mothman at the time. Like oh, really? uh, an, another podcast that I listened to, like was doing an episode on the Mothman prophecies. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With Richard Gere. And then there was another podcast I listened to that was doing something else. I was talking about Mothman. I was like, what is happening right now? <laughs> and then I see this cover. I was like, oh man, it's amazing. So I, yeah, I, I just can't wait for that to drop. So, so, uh, you know, you can read it and check it out. When is it, when is it dropping again? Um, the release date is March 29th. March 29th. It's coming up very, very fast, like in a month and a half or so. Yeah, yeah. And that was kind of part of it, too, was I was really wanting um, – so I'm going to SoccerCon this year, and I'm actually involved in planning a charity event that's going to be like the official SoccerCon kickoff um, at the Stanley Hotel um, that's on May the 10th. And so I was like – when I was finally realizing like, oh, I'm actually going to leave the house. I'm going to be somewhere like, and I was like, I really kind of need another book out. And then I was like, okay, let me see how I can ridiculously accelerate this entire timeline, you know? <laughs> so it just, it worked out beautifully and I'm super excited to have it out for that. But it is funny that you say that about Mothman because it's like, it just felt like one of those like synchronicity things, right? Like um, I noticed that Nicole Cushing like announced, um, uh, she's got a book called Moth Woman coming out in like August, which is super exciting. I, I was that. like, oh yeah. my gosh. And when we announced um, mine, I think somebody uh, sent me a message or tagged me with something where there was like a Mothman, like graphic novel coming out like very soon. And I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> like all Mothman all the time. It's like zombies had their moment. Vampires right. had the moment. Now it's Mothman's <laughs> it's turn. It's all about Mothman. <laughs> awesome. Well, you've come on uh, to talk about Mothman Prophecy. No. no. <laughs> so you've come on to confess your horror sin of never having seen Kronos from 1993. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Which is actually funny because when we were emailing, 
I was, I, I, you said Kronos and two other movies. I was like, well, I've seen Kronos and uh, that, that might, might be a cool film. But then I, was, I looked at the trailer. I was like, I have never seen this movie. And I think I was getting confused with uh, Guillermo del Toro's other movie. Like, uh, I think it's called uh, Mimic, perhaps, where that also is a bug horror. And so I was like, oh, shit, a Guillermo del Toro movie that I haven't seen. Hell yeah. Right. So, such a gift. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, what I typically ask is, how did this particular movie pass you by? I don't have an interesting answer for that. It's just, <laughs> okay. it's more, again, that I um, I just haven't seen much of anything. <laughs> like okay. in, in any movie genre, you can list, like, there's all these classics that everyone's like, seriously, Hightower, like, how do you exist in the world? And um, so this was, this was just one of them. And I, um, I was really thrilled to watch this because it, it was really really enjoyable but yeah it it didn't you know i don't have a great story i listened to jessica mccue's episode where she was talking about how like the people under the stairs and it was the big like billboard i was like that's an excellent reason that's like the best reason ever like <laughs> yeah she was terrified about that for years right because that's the worst like, part is like, like they, they they kept it up for three years just taunting her <laughs> it's awesome uh, well, that no, that's fine. Like uh, sometimes it's just as simple as you just didn't get around to it. And in fact, like even though it is a Guillermo del Toro movie, it is his first movie and it's not as well known. I, I just don't. I don't think people know about it and talk. It, it doesn't get brought up a lot in the horror, like in the horror community or in horror conversation that I've that I've had with other people. I've talked to people specifically about Guillermo del Toro about his movies, and nobody has brought up Kronos. You know, really. Yeah, so I was so exci- yeah, I was so excited when when you, when you brought it up, and I realized I hadn't seen it, and then I saw it, and I ended up loving it. So I I went into it. I tried going into it clear with blank slate, like knowing nothing about it other than the trailer, and I don't remember if the trailer gave anything away, but um, but I saw it on HBO Max, and they have this little like two or three minute trailer um interview with Guillermo del Toro before and he gives away the the oh, the no. turn and I was like what the <laughs> fuck man so that I was kind of pissed off about that but but still I mean so what did you think when that turn came around when it you find out that it was a vampire story or did you know already going in I did not um I kind of try to avoid seeing anything like that because um I mean, if I can, but you know, again, like when, some, when a movie's been out like twenty years, like you can't. Yeah, you know, I'm like, well, yeah, I had gone the whole twenty years without, <laughs> and it just at the last minute. That's at the little cool. last minute. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I mean, I just, uh, I, and the funny thing is, probably, I don't dislike vampire, um, uh, books or or films i just i will say it's not something that like my thing is ghosts so like if you tell me something is a ghost story like i'm on it like i don't care who made it i don't care how bad it is like i'm like i want it i want to watch the ghosts um in vampires i don't really feel that way about but i don't avoid it either and i i just i loved and see this i feel like this really reminded me how many different takes there are on any given trope you know Mm. because i think del toro is so I was trying to think the whole time I was watching it, like what it is that sets his movies apart because they really are like in a class of their own. Like I feel like in the way that you experience it, you know, and I don't know if it's the characters or exactly how he does that, but I feel like this was such a cool take on it that like, you know, when, when it is the turn and you realize and you're just like, Oh, I kind of can't wait to see how this goes. Cause you've already got all these other like wicked elements, you know, and you're just like, Oh, okay. How is this going to roll? Yeah, this it's like barely a vampire story, but it's a vampire story, you know, like he touches on it, but he touches also like on the monster movie stuff and like also like a really touching story between a grandfather and like a granddaughter. And so uh, it's, yeah. it's it's uh, yeah, he, he's a master and, and, you, and you can see that from his first movie. And what you're saying about Guillermo, Guillermo del Toro, like doing it differently, I think he puts like a level of detail that nobody else does or very few people do. And it just shows up on camera. For example, the intricate detail of the Kronos machine, yes. just it, it looks amazing and it looks like it could work. And then also the book that the, um, 
that has like all, all the the writings of the um i forget what the guy's called is um the alchemist the alchemist yeah, right, yeah. thank you the, the the alchemist's book with all his scribblings or writings and all that he pulls it out and we see page after page i know that guillermo del toro has been the one to do that in previous in, in movies after this for uh for like pan's labyrinth he like wrote out all that intricate stuff and like a lot of it is his drawings because he's his imagination is just so amazing that he can do that, you know? So I think that's one of the the things that if he's going to do a vampire movie, he's going to do a vampire movie his way, which, which <laughs> yes. is what we got. So we are talking about Kronos from 1993, written and directed by Guillermo del Toro, starring Federico Lupe as Jesus Gris and starring Tamara Sanath as Aurora, Ron Perlman as Angel de la Guardia, Claudio Brook as Dieter de la Guardia, and Margarita Isabel as Mercedes. And before I get into it, it's a really small cast. What is it? Two, four, five with Margarita, but Margarita isn't, or sorry, with Mercedes, but Mercedes isn't in it very much. So it's really like four characters that, that we kind of get to know in this in this movie now i think that goes like with low budget films maybe he didn't have a high budget with it but i think it works works really well it does yeah because it allows you know where you mentioned before like the really touching on that relationship with the grandfather and the granddaughter it allows for that intimacy like you you know it allows you to see because i don't know i have this thing with like uh like these unearned relationships right like where somebody's trying to you know a director's trying to like make us care about this character that we we haven't been getting any, you know, there's nothing been earned there. And just like in the short period of time, like in, you know, in the entrance and stuff like that, you really see what makes their relationship special. Yeah. I agree. Like he picks her up, puts on his shoulders and just like, he's very playful with her and loving with her. Yeah. It was, it was kind of beautiful. All right. So uh, the film begins in 1536 with an alchemist creating a device that will give him eternal life. 400 years later, we see the scene of a tragic accident where a vault collapsed and one of the deceased was the alchemist who had been pierced through the heart with a wood stake. So I feel like this is kind of like a um, coy nod. Like the first time you're seeing it, if you don't know, it's a vampire. It's like a kind of coy nod to it being a vampire, but like that would kill anybody. But also, right. it would kill an undead vampire, you know. So I, 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 I like. I saw what he was doing there, and I appreciated it. I'm glad you pointed that out because I missed it utterly. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was really entranced with his marble skin. Yeah, it looks so it, weird. It does, and it was such a cool aspect of it, which I think is like part of all those like really cool elements is what distracts it from the knowledge that it's a, or at least me, because apparently I'm not not paying that close of attention, but um, I feel like it's, it's what really sets it apart. It's all this other stuff. That's part of the legend. Yeah. And also his characters all have something interesting about them, yes. you know, which I love. Uh, we got uh, what Ron Perlman with the nose job thing, yes. <laughs> which is amazing. Aurora, she's the small girl. She uh, doesn't talk very much. And um but she carries around like the the the, the glow in the stick, glow in the dark. What are they called? Yeah, glow in the dark sticks, right? Yeah. Like she carries that around. She, they're the the person at the funeral home. It's like really very interesting. The one who oh who, he yeah. was great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so he 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 uh, inhabits his world with interesting characters, and it helps. I think that helps the movie a lot. Otherwise, it's just like boring characters that you don't really care about. Yeah. Yeah, and just like two dimensional. So, you know, I thought that was so interesting with Ron Perlman, like making him. I mean, obviously, he's a terrible person, but <laughs> it's like the, you know, the first time you kind of meet him when he comes in there, you don't hate him. Like you're waiting for him to do something awful, like immediately. And instead, he's charming. Really charming. Yeah. But charming, but also like scary. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how, to, I don't know how he does it, but, but he does it amazingly. So then, uh, the alchemist skin appears strange. It appears non-human and it has like this marble white color, but also texture. And uh, at the alchemist mansion, a dead corpse is discovered with blood being drained from it. 
The Kronos, which the alchemist created for eternal life, is not documented in the sale of all of his possessions, including his home, and the basins of blood discovered in the home were never revealed to the public. So in the present day, we find Jesus Gris, an antique dealer who is married to Mercedes. They look after their deceased son's daughter, Aurora. At his shop, Jesus has a strange man come into his shop looking at statues by peeling away their wrappings. Uh, the man leaves after he sees one in particular. This was a really scary scene for me because we, he's an old man and we have a little girl. And then we have this this person who looks like a drug addict or, or, or is fiending for drugs or something like that coming in the shop, actually looking for something in the end. Jesus is like following him around, asking him, can I help you? And the man doesn't respond at all, basically. And so I was like, oh man, is something going happen, to happen to him very early on? Like, he looks like a sweet old man and I didn't want anything to happen, <laughs> even <laughs> though I'm watching this horror movie, right? <laughs> but it's a master stroke in building tension in different ways. You know, like I feel like sometimes we get stuck on the idea that like the ultimate awful thing that can happen to you in a movie or in a book is death, right? It's murder. It's, you know, this kind of thing. And it was hugely tension building um, just to watch him go around. Cause yeah, you're like, this guy is clearly not right. Like the fact that he won't respond, which made, when Ron Perlman shows up, it set him apart immediately because he very pleasantly responded, you know, and was communicative. And it makes you feel like if they're not going to say anything, then it's, I don't know. It makes you feel like it's because they're like, oh, I'm not getting committed because I'm going to, I'm getting ready to do something awful to you. Yeah. And I, yeah, I love what you, you point out the, the contrast between that drug addict or uh, I don't know how else to say it, but this random person and when Ron Perlman's character Angel comes in, he's like charming and like, he's like, oh, I'm just here to pick this up. You know, he's like, he's just yeah. got this ease about him, you know? So later, Jesus, while putting a puzzle together with Aurora, finds cockroaches pouring out of the statue. Uh, <laughs> I think <clears throat> I didn't quite get that. Is So it's a supernatural a little bit because... Like who, uh, obviously those cockroaches weren't in there the whole time. So who is conjuring up those cockroaches? I think it's a small pothole that, that I can I can abide with. It's it's not that big of a deal, but I was wondering where did they come from? It's a cool effect. I hate cockroaches. I don't want to see them. You too. And yeah. actually, I think they probably were in that statue the whole time. Because that's one of the things that's like the worst things about cockroaches is like you can move from a place that has, you know, like a cockroach infestation, but you're going to want to check absolutely everything. And you're going to want to like bust, bust open stuff like that because they will travel with you. They will hide in the yeah. weirdest places. So I'm thinking there's a strong possibility they were in there the whole time. I'm having a little PTSD right now, Laura, because the oh, house God. that we're living in <laughs> right now had a cockroach infestation when we bought it. And uh, uh, it took us like three or four months to completely rid them. And like, that's what we had, like our food in, in uh, plastic containers, nothing in the refrigerator. It was, everything was like, ugh, it was terrible. So I'm having a little bit, I'm breathing a little heavy. I think I have to take a break. <laughs> no. no, but yeah, when, when I saw that, I was like, oh, that's so nasty. But it brought his attention to that particular statue. So he opens it up in the bottom and fr finds the Kronos inside. Um, he has no idea what it is and thinks it's merely a funny toy. And he starts playing with it. He puts it into his hand and, until it's, and he winds it up. Uh, and then these razor sharp stingers pierce into his skin. And it looks like that really hurts. And it's actually, he ends up ripping it off of him. And there's just blood everywhere. I think it was, it was kind of cool to see that. Just like the blood on the white shirt and, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Well, one question I did have, and it's kind of, moving forward a little bit, but I, I, I don't want to forget it is as we go on throughout the movie, we find that he has a rehealing factor, but the hand itself never fully heals. He always keeps the wrap on. Yeah. And I was just curious about that. Uh, That's a good I don't know point. why that was. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. I kind of wondered later whether, you know, I mean, he, it probably didn't initially heal because he didn't finish the treatment or the, you know, whatever the whatever the i don't know what we want to call it when he when he puts that thing on him you know but um he didn't that didn't play itself out fully and there was a piece of it a little piece of the pincher that stayed in there 
until Mercedes pulled it out for him. So I wonder yeah. if it was like one of those things where he didn't, you know, he didn't have the regeneration factor at that point and maybe where it got embedded in there. And then I wonder after he, you know, after everything happened to him, whether it was just more of a habit thing for him to have it on. I don't know. Yeah, that's true because he, so after it happens, he goes to Mercedes work and she is a tango, is a tango or salsa dancer giving lessons and she, she owns a building. And uh, he kind of like interrupts this dance lesson she's giving maybe with uh, like a, a, she's cheating maybe with her dance. I don't know. There was some kind of love interest in the air. And then they noticed that Jesus was there. It's like, Oh shit. But yeah, she ends up, she bandages him and pulls out that stinger. I, I don't know the significance of the stinger. I don't know if there is any uh, uh, other than maybe it just happens the first time or does it happen every time? I'm not sure. They don't, they don't show, but it looks no. really <laughs> painful. Right? Yes. So later in the night, Jesus has uncontrollable itching and pain that is only alleviated when the Kronos is reattached to his body, allowing the device to drain his blood. We then are introduced to Angel, who is the nephew of De La Guardia, a very sick man who is in search of the Kronos. Angel purchases the statue from Jesus, not knowing that the Kronos has been taken out. Uh, Jesus' health and strength are increasing in the meantime. And Aurora recognizes something is wrong and hides the Kronos. Jesus comes back home and wants to use the the Kronos and can't find it. He sees that uh, Aurora has hidden it, and he goes up to this play uh, I don't know play shed that she has on the top of their roof, and it looks very unsafe. But yes, but, <laughs> tetanus but she, all over the place. Yeah, but she has this area for herself to play, and he goes in there and he tells her this story. Um, it's slipping my mind right now. Do you, it's about do you the tobacco. It was about his son, um, learning, you know, that, that, uh, smoking was connected to lung cancer and learning that some people had died of it. And so, you know, in order, because then he got worried about his father and thinking it was going to kill him. So he took all his cigarettes and shredded them up in the toilet. And so he, he found little shreds of tobacco all over the bathroom, um, so I, I thought that was a great story, too, because I thought it was a great way to connect what Aurora was doing at the time. Um, and I don't know, it also just showed to me, it showed such an awareness as a parent and as a grandparent of the thought processes of a child and, you know, good ways to communicate to them. And that was something that I noticed with him, like he was never angry at Aurora. Like he would feel, he would be angry sometimes if he felt like she was in danger and then he was, you know, he was frightened for her, but otherwise it's, you know, whatever she did, it was like, he just, he understood it. He got it. And he felt like sometimes he had to help or fix it, but he never, you really never see him like yelling at her or, you know, get it back to me or, you know, anything like that. And it's just, it just made that same vein of connection run through the whole movie. Yeah, he he was patient with her. Yes. And yeah. you know, love is patient, love is kind. Like he had this love for for his granddaughter. And I'm sure it comes from the fact not only that that is your granddaughter, but also your son has passed away. Now this is the only remaining thing of your son in the world. And I'm sure that that's brought their bond a lot closer. And so he's just really it's just a beautiful relationship they have and he doesn't even at his worst when he is like dying and like literally shedding, molting, yeah. <laughs> he's still patient with her. And it's just great. So once De La Guardia learns that Cronus is missing, he has Jesus's shop vandalized and he leaves his cart. Jesus visits De La Guardia's factory after he convinces Aurora to give the Cronos back to him. Here, the, oh, and also she hid it in her teddy bear, right? Here, the dying man explains to Jesus that an insect lives inside the Kronos, and it feeds upon Jesus's blood, while at the same time providing eternal life to the human being it feeds upon. So Jesus leaves the Kronos with De La Guardia, or so the man thinks. It's really only stu uh, two steel locks. Which was kind of a nod to them cutting. I felt like that was such a, you know, because they had cut the lock off of his, his uh, shop door. Yeah. And I, I, I thought that was very much like a couple middle fingers in the air, like, oh, okay, that's how you feel about it? Here, have two. So while Jesus, Mercedes, and Aurora are at a party for New Year's Eve, 
Jesus begins to have a thirst for blood. Actually, let me back up a little bit. So they're getting ready for this party and Jesus is in the bathroom and he, and he's getting his fix really, because at this point he's a drug addict and he puts it up onto his chest and he's getting rejuvenated and he's looking for, um, he's looking younger. He shaved his mustache off. He's looking fly. Then he, he takes it off and then he rubs, he rubs off where the injection points were. And there's a little bit of like pins of blood, blood, but, but it's been fully healed. Yeah. And so that's why, that's when I start to think, I'm sorry to apologize. Go ahead. Oh no. I, I I was thinking like, cause not only is it healed and like the blood washes away, but there's that like sticky, uh, like material that's kind of like just a little bit that's kind of secreted from it. Um, And also I'd like to just give you a dad joke. He's not a drug addict. He's a bug addict. (laughs) That's a good one. (laughs) Um, So I didn't, I didn't like, the use of the word secrete. And I also, <laughs> I also don't like the, that, that visual they gave us of like that, that, yeah. <laughs> the whole thing right there. I didn't, I didn't appreciate that, but I did like the dad joke. <laughs> so, um, so the, they're getting ready for this uh, New Year's Eve party. So then they go uh, and at the New Year's Eve party, Jesus begins to have a thirst for blood and f- follows a man who's having a nosebleed into the bathroom. So while first trying to lick the blood off of, so I apologize, let me back up. So the man goes up to the sink and is washing his nose, trying to get it to stop. And some of the blood falls onto the sink and, and then onto the floor. So first, while first trying to lick the blood off of the sink, another man comes in and, and cleans off all that, all that blood. And then after he leaves, Jesus looks down and sees that, there's the, the guy's blood is on the floor and actually kneels down to lick it. This scene was <laughs> so fucked up. And so it, it, it harkens. It makes me think of, have you ever seen Bram Stoker's Dracula? The one that uh, made by Francis Ford Coppola. Um, the one with um, Keanu Reeves. Yeah. And uh, Gary, Gary Oldman. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Gary Oldman. So, so in that movie, you remember that Gary Oldman as Dracula uh, is helping to shave Keanu Reeves, Jonathan Harker, or whatever, yeah, and yeah. licks the the blood off the razor. Yeah, like that gives me. Uh, that's one of the like the visuals I always have in my mind, and I probably brought up on the podcast a bunch of times. But this now is going in the pantheon of those yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of those images that just stay with you forever. He's like uh, specifically on the uh, uh, the blood on the sink. He's like taking with his finger and like, it looks like he's trying to put it in a row. Like, like you do with Coke, with cocaine. Yeah, it's yeah. just like, like all he needed was a credit card and he's like a, a dollar bill and just go, <laughs> you know, but it's so nasty. And then he, he, he doesn't able, he was, wasn't able to do it because the, the guy comes and washes it down. Then he sees it on the floor and like, I'm like, no, there's no way. <laughs> there's no way. Cause we're in the bathroom. Yeah, it's marble, but it's we're in the bathroom and he oh, just gets on this floor bathroom. a public bath. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't even do it in my bathroom, let alone a no. public bathroom. And uh, I mean, although there is a five second rule, but at this point we're like no. at two minutes. <laughs> also, it came, if it originates in someone else's nose, there are no <laughs> there are no seconds, there's no minutes, there's okay. nothing involved. All right, all right, I'll back on check with you, Laura. You're right, you're right. <laughs> I got lost in the sauce for a bit. So <laughs> All right, so he's on the floor and he just starts licking it up, and he looks like in in um, a lot of the best horror, uh, best vampire movies, or even in some recent vampire stuff. I won't say names because I don't want to do any spoilers. When a vampire sees blood, they're like locked in and they don't see or recognize anything that's happening externally, yeah. and that's what's happening here with him. Like he's like in pure blood mode, and he's licking his blood off and all of a sudden Anhel comes up well we see a pair of uh, shoes walk we hear a pair of shoes walking up then we see them come in and just kicks him in the face and knocks him out which I thought was such a good use of like creating tension in the atmosphere too because yeah you're right I mean he, it's perfect conveyance of that like single-mindedness of that obsession for it you know the the need the just he's focused only on the blood because you can sort of experience that with him, but also like we as the audience hear those footsteps. So we know someone's coming in and even like stopping and kind of standing over him. And we're like, 
first of all, gross, but also, dude, like, look up. This is not going to go well for you. Like, I don't care who's in there. This is not going to end well. <laughs> right. For me, it was like, oh, man, he's going to be embarrassed. Yeah. I never in my mind thought Angel would be there. Then when he was, I was like, fuck, we're in danger now. And it's sad because... He excused him. He was having a lovely time with Mercedes. Like they were dancing yeah. and they were, I feel like he's been rejuvenated. There's like interest in like uh, maybe more sexual desire as an older man. And like he, they're, they're, um, they're just vibing. And then he's like, he excuses himself to go to the washroom to get this blood. And then they never see him again until yeah. he returns, you know? So this is the last moment that they see him alive. Yeah. And them <laughs> sitting there, you know, as the, as the clock strikes and everyone's kissing, you know, and they're just sitting there alone, like, and, and Mercedes and Aurora don't seem to connect very well. Um, right. They, yeah. you know, it doesn't seem like Mercedes is like uh, overtly mean to her or unwelcoming, but she doesn't seem very welcoming either. It's clear that the relationship is with um, Jesus. So yeah, mm. that them sitting alone at the table, you know, with that kind of bubble burst was was pretty heartbreaking. Um, so Angel ties him up and tries to get the chronos from him, but Angel won't tell him where it is. So I, I actually, so he takes him to like a deserted mountain side area and he tries to get the information from him, but Angel won't tell him. So then this leads to Angel knocking Jesus out once more and then pushing him off a cliff inside of his car. And before he does that, uh, Angel asks him, what is this anyway? Like, why does my uncle want it? And he tells him that he wants it for eternal life. And Angel's like, why does he want eternal life? <laughs> he's like, because he, uh, De La Guardia is like all, he's had like multiple surgeries, multiple organs replaced. He keeps them in his oh, yeah. room that he lives in, <laughs> right? So he's like, why would he ever want to live longer? So he just doesn't get it. You know? Yeah. And uh, so he pushes him off a cliff inside of his car and he, he dies. But but at, at the bottom of the cliff, Guillermo del Toro does this wonderful, like, 180 degree turn. And we see, uh, we have this voiceover from Jesus who he's dying. He says, look at all this blood. This is all my blood. And it he's upside down and the camera turns upside down. And so it's like, I don't know what it's trying to say, but if, to me it felt like you had this life, you, you got fucked up through the Kronos device, and now your world has been turned upside down, like literally. You know? Yeah. And yeah. he's about to become an undead being. Yeah. So yeah. it's great. I, I just, uh, I, you know, just Guillermo being Guillermo. So very quickly, so they don't really, oh, this is one thing I wanted to say. This is a Christmas movie. Oh, I'm right. always looking <laughs> for more Christmas movies other than like Black Christmas and the other ones like Gremlins that people know. And so this one's going into my Christmas rotation. Yes. <laughs> I had not, that had not occurred to me, but you're so right. It's yeah. definitely a Christmas movie. So a couple of days pass, I would assume, because they have the funeral very quickly. And then this is where we meet that funeral director or I don't know, the coroner? Mortician. I mortician. Think the mortician's the one who's working on him, right? Yeah, yeah, the mortician. Yeah, yeah. And great. the mortician is just a great character. He's got like sideburns, like open chest with the gold medallions, and he's just like chewing on gum. Basically a big ham. He is hamming it up for the for the movie. <laughs> but I love it. And like he's like talking about he's how he's an artist and he's like stapling it and then he's putting like plastic uh like wax over it to cover the staples to make it presentable for the funeral. Yeah. And, then, and then like the funeral director standing behind him. And what does he say? Do you, do you remember? Here? Yeah. He's, he was, you know, cause he's complimenting the whole time. He's like, Oh, you're just an artist. This is amazing. But don't spend too much time on him. Cause we're cremating him anyway. <laughs> yeah. It's just, my heart like was crushed for him. I was like, what? <laughs> he's been doing all this work. Are you kidding me? Yeah. He's like, what? You know, nobody respects my art. <laughs> I was like, yeah, man, I feel you. I feel you. <laughs> so then they, they have the funeral and, we don't see, I thought it was interesting. Maybe they cut it for time or they just didn't have a lot of time to do it, but they don't film a scene where uh, of the actual funeral. Right. And so we don't have to see Mercedes being sad and we don't have to see Aurora being sad. It, it just cuts to the next scene where the funeral is over and he's getting ready to burn 
the cremate the body. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, I always think that's such a good choice because like with funerals and weddings, right? We know what happens. We don't need to see the whole ceremony. It's kind of hard enough to sit through them, you know, when you're going and attending them for family or something like, you know, watching someone's whole wedding. Um, so I always like it when directors make the choice to be like, okay, there's a suggestion of this event, but we don't need to see all of these things that you can. And I think that again, is part of what makes this so successful is like, he trusts the viewer to connect the dots. Like he doesn't have to show you every little part, you know, which, which helps keep it smaller, but more effective because he has, he then has the screen time to convey, you know, other things that are more interesting. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that that completely makes sense. Like, like you said, we've all seen weddings, we've all seen funerals. We don't need to see this again. Show something new, and they do in this scene where he's about to be cremated, yeah. and then, uh, and then uh, the mortician puts him, you know, loads him up. Oh wait, let me. So he's he tries to light the the furnace, and then it doesn't light, so he goes downstairs. Um, hamming it up all the way. And then he, he messes with some propane tanks or whatever, comes back up. And we see that the the coffin has now been opened. Yeah. But he doesn't think anything of it. He just closes it and shoves it back in there. And then, so we, we know that Jesus has escaped. And then Angel comes with the funeral director and, and is like, yeah, um, the, uh, Mr. De La Guardia is a really good family, a uh, friend of the family, and they want to see the body one last time. And he's like, yeah, 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 sure, I'll show you, I'll show you. He's right in there. <laughs> and, he, and I was like, what? And he just goes and puts his face to him and he like smiles, like it's over with. Which uh, I was wondering about that too. I guess in retrospect, it makes sense that um, his uncle, he just wanted to make sure that, that he was really dead, um, that the heart, I guess, had been destroyed. So ostensibly the cremation would have taken care of that. Um, and also like, I mean, like he has such a good attention to detail, like, he, the coffin is open in such a way that the mortician's not going to see into it, right? Mm. All he does is shove it down on his side. So that's, you don't have to suspend reality to think, ah, yeah, he's not going to think much of that. And then also I noticed that they were smart about making sure that like, I mean, if he'd had to move the coffin personally, right, he'd know he, there'd be a huge difference. And instead they make sure and show he's got the little cart. He puts it on the little conveyor belt. So there's no reason for him to notice that the body is no longer in there. And I just thought like, well done, you know, with, with these little things that can totally break the spell. Yeah, that's, uh, I noticed that as well. And I'm so glad you brought that up because that's exactly right. If we're watching this movie and we're like, okay, I could forgive not, maybe not remembering if you shut the top. Sure. No problem. But, but if you push it yourself, you can feel that it's a very empty thing, but he doesn't, <laughs> he has that machine. So it's an excellent point. And that does go to, to the details of, you know, that Guillermo del Toro, yeah, is always known for. Yeah, and that included in that too. I thought was so cool. You know, when um, when Jesus gets dressed again, on you know on the clothes that that he had his funeral in, like you see that it's been cut. Like it's not just like a like a you know a suit or a tuxedo. This is something that's been specifically altered to be able to be put onto a corpse because you know moving dead weight is not something that is easy to do and so like them committing to that whole like the truth of the scenario you know so because i love it because it's like you know sometimes with this undead stuff you either have like someone immediately look like a rotting zombie and you're like what happened you, you know you got really got expedited or you see someone you know like tom cruise climbing up out of their grave like look i'm a sexy whatever and it's like no you're you're going to be wearing a gross suit. You're, you're, you're going to, your hair is going to be messy. You're going to have that <laughs> waxy stuff dripping yeah. off where they fixed you. Yeah. Your mouth is going to be shut with, with, yes. uh, you know, with twine or whatever. So yeah, yeah, they did a great job. So believing Jesus to be burned on head returns to his uncle telling him that Jesus, I should say is dead. So then uh, Jesus is wandering the night. Uh, until he uh, and th th he like steps into some glass and that's a gnarly scene. Yeah. Um, then he he takes out that the, the his mouth is so has been sewed shut and he takes that out and like this is just a great scene of him like walking through the night like being completely like uh, bewildered as far as how he's like he literally came back from the dead. Yeah. And like you said, his his uh, 
suit is all like cut in the back and does he he does he turn it around at this point i think so yeah and he, yeah he's got to fish out something you know and and the it just conveys to like how cut off he is like from the life he had like it doesn't matter that he's still technically among the living he's he can't there's no space for him anymore because like i thought that was so good when he calls his wife and all he does is says her name and she's so upset by it she slams down the phone and he's realistically realizing like i can't get this connection back you know yeah that i mean where do you get the change for the <laughs> for the call <laughs> we're gonna move that past is a that. really good <laughs> <laughs> i'm always looking at the little details but you know it's it i'll let it pass because it was it's a really sad scene because she has been so affected by his death and she's just like sitting at her uh sitting on her bed and just like staring out into the void and gets this call and it's his voice. And I'm sure she's freaked either that or somebody is like pulling a prank on her or something. Yeah. So um, eventually he returns home where Aurora is waiting for him with a towel. And I wonder if this, just think about it now. I wonder if she knew it was going to happen because why else is she just waiting around, waiting for her her grandfather to come? Or why is she waiting with a towel? Or, you know, maybe it was just luck that she was... I, I don't think it was luck like that she just had this towel waiting for him. I think maybe she knew... She's very smart. She doesn't talk a lot, but she's very smart, and she's picking up on things. And uh, so maybe she had a, an inkling that he might be back. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that, you know, why she was, was seemed to be expecting him. Um, I did think the towel was so effective, too, because, like, you know, here he's been uh, so cut off from everything. He's, you know, he's got this lonely, cold wandering out there. And can you imagine, like, anything nicer than, like, you walk in your home that you feel like, is this even my home anymore? And someone's holding out, like, a warm, dry towel, you know, for it to, to get rid of the, like, the cold and the wet of the outside. Like, and you can see him looking at it like it's the most beautiful thing he's <laughs> ever seen. And I thought that was just so, I mean, all of that is conveyed without dialogue at all. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. It's really effective. I'm sorry. We have, um, Honey buns. Babe, honey, mommy's on podcast. Okay. I apologize. No worries. If you need to take a break, we can. All right. Tell me real quick. Okay. Okay. Good. I'm glad, baby. Okay. Well, that's okay. Love you, bud. I'm sorry. No worries. That's... He's, he's gotten used to like he loves to make cameos on podcasts too. So <laughs> that's cool. Uh, um, so I was just saying that, uh, yeah, it was really effective the, the way that Guillermo del Toro did that. So, so then she helps to hide her grandfather upstairs in her uh, play shed. Yeah, and she even like, um, so he's standing up there, and because it's old and decrepit, there's a bunch of holes in like the tin roof. And so when the sun comes out, he gets burned by it. And then he, she has made up her toy chest for him, has a little pillow in there and a cover. And I just thought that's so, so beautiful. Um, yeah. That she's just like, this is my grandfather. I'm going to do whatever he needs. I wonder too, because again, I hadn't thought about it until you mentioned, you know, that she was sort of like anticipating his return. She has gotten that chest set up for him before she sees the effect of the sun. You know, so it's almost like she anticipated that ahead of him. Like she already had this knowledge that, hey, he's going to need to be kept out of sunlight. So this is what I'm prepping for him. Yeah, because we do see him earlier in the movie immediately after getting like the morning, the next morning after being stung, like he closes the shades when Mercedes is reading because it's too bright in there for him. So I, yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't think it's beyond the pale to, to believe that Aurora is very astute and is paying attention very observant and could be like um, anticipating her grandfather's needs. Yeah. Yeah. So um, she gives him a toy chest to sleep in like a coffin and also helps him to compose a letter to his wife explaining everything. But yeah. before that, as, as he's sleeping, she's waiting for him in the room in that uh, play shed and she's 
um, painting on the roof, or I'm sorry, she's painting on the wall. And you can see like, she's kind of painting the story of what happened to her. There's a son and then there's a toy chest where, where her grandfather is. And there's an arrow pointing in, like saying that he's in there, all that sort of stuff. Like, so she's coping with this, the way she knows how, which is like to just write out the story because she can't verbally tell anybody. And also yeah. she's been in there the whole day and the grandmother, or at least Mercedes, I don't know if that's her uh, like blood grandmother, but um, she doesn't come looking for her, Yeah, you know, or, or at least we don't see it, you know? So that, yeah, that also further point. goes to show the relationship that they have. Yeah. So um, he, he writes a letter to his wife kind of explaining what's going on. He says that he uh, he hopes that she can learn to love him, even though he looks different. But before he can do, come back home, he needs to find he needs to get some information. And so he's going to uh, to uh, De La Guardia's factory and he goes there by himself. But he very soon realizes that Aurora followed him. Yeah. And this is the only time we see him get angry at her. And it's not it, it's more frightened for her because she's in danger because he's in danger. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was really effective too. And just, I don't know, he just seems like such an ideal sort of like caretaker, you know, that, that whole relationship between them just seems so, it's just so beautifully done. Yeah. So then um, they're in search of the alchemist's book and De La Guardia catches them with the book. And he promises Jesus to give him a way out of what is happening to him if he gives him. Sorry, I'm up in the second floor and it just sounded like somebody knocked on my window. Ah, shit. <laughs> so, so. My wife's not home either. Okay, let me start that over again. So um, they're in search of the alchemist's book and um, De La Guardia wakes up. I, I don't think we kind of said that De La Guardia lives like a hermit. And his cousin, no, I'm sorry, his nephew, Angel, kind of does everything for him because he's a very rich man and he's hoping for an inheritance. And he kind of lives like Howard Hughes. Yeah. I, yeah. And, and that whole thing, like everything is marble and um, stainless steel, that sort of thing. So they're in this room that the LaGuardia lives in and, and he catches them looking for the book and he promises to give Jesus a way out of what's happening to him. If he gives him the chronos, um, Jesus does, he takes it out of um, Aurora's teddy bear and then gives it to him. And then immediately the LaGuardia stabs him. And he says, this is your way out. The only way out is through death, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. And so he's attacking him. And then all of a sudden, Aurora smashes him over the head with his own cane. Which was wicked. I love it. Like she is, she has agency, you know, yeah. she's, she's in this and she's part of the story and she's helping her, her grandfather. Um, it's great. I, I, I love Aurora as a character. Yeah, I do too. And I want to back up real quick to just before De La Guardia um, stabs him to where he's, you know, he's, he's telling him like, why would you want this? I'm disgusting. You know, I've got, I'm rotting, like I'm all this stuff. And, and he tells him to like tear his own skin off because the marble skin is underneath. And I thought, first of all, like the delivery of that line, tear it off, you know, like was amazing. And then, you know, the questioning way he does it. And then sort of that whole, like, I don't know. I thought that was so effective because I loved the marble skin to begin with, with the alchemist and then having it kind of show through and be like part of this, I don't know. I thought that was such a great like part of the scene. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. I forgot to mention that it, it looks so like the, the makeup work is pretty good in, in this movie. And I think that they were, they did a good job of not taking off that whole thing yeah. because it would have looked like you just taken off a mask and that could have been cheesy, but yeah. they had it coming through and he was just ripping off bits and pieces of it. Yeah. It looked really effective. <laughs> Even then like that, that's not a sales point. Like, okay. Like, my my face my skin rotted off and now I look like a marble like marble yeah. like <laughs> oh, you're not you're not making, making it better, better. yeah this is great this is awesome yeah I'm go home, my wife's gonna be all about it <laughs> <laughs> so but then um, because De La Guardia is on the floor because he's been knocked out by by Aurora Jesus is like come on let's go but then he notices De La Guardia on the floor blood pooling around his head and he can't help himself yeah 
excuse me. <clears throat> so he can't help himself and he has to like go and attack him. And this isn't, he actually bites him. It looks like he bites him anyway. We don't see any fangs or anything like that, but basically he's feeding on his blood. Yep. So uh, before that happened, um, De La Guardia did ring the buzzer for, for Anhel to come up. And so Anhel comes up and uh, he sees De La Guardia on the floor and he, he believes his uncle to be dead and, and he like rejoices. He does this like huge, like he bends over and just goes, ah, ha, 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 finally. I'm like, oh shit. He's going to get his nose job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because before that he did get hit in the head. Uh, uh, oh, the uncle yes. <laughs> did hit him with a cane and broke his nose again or broke his nose. And he's like, fuck. So he was ecstatic about it. But then um, De La Guardia calls out to him. And upon seeing that his uncle is still alive, Angel puts his foot on his neck and crushes it, yeah. killing him. Um, and I think, I, I know we've seen earlier in the movie, sorry, one second. Earlier in the movie, um, Angel was trying to get him to sign his will, right? Yeah. And so, like, he's like, a- after he killed him, he's like, "You made me wait too long." Like, he was waiting for his inheritance, and so this this charming man that that we first met, he's actually a monster. He's definitely like pushed. You know, he put he pushed Jesus off the off the thing. So I mean, he's definitely right. But I also really had this thought here. Like, I was like, really, Angel and Jesus are not shouldn't necessarily be diametrically opposed, right? Like, you know, he doesn't, Angel doesn't seem to want the Kronos device. Um, and once he's free of his uncle, you're like, why don't you just go get a nose job? You know, like ha- live your life, be free. Like why would, you know, so there was almost this thought that maybe like they were just going to be like, you know, okay, let's part the best of friends. So, you know, <laughs> let me know how your nose heals. Like, and that yeah. just sort of did not happen. <laughs> That would have been nice. That would have been a different movie. Would have, would have been, nice. <laughs> been very different. Movie. I think uh, um, so what happens is, uh, in order to uh, for Jesus and Aurora to get away, Jesus hits um, Angel in the nose and breaks it again, or at least yeah. reopens a wound. And so Angel is pissed about that, and he's like, "All right, I killed you once. I meant to kill you again." But perhaps if he didn't, if that didn't, ha- he was seeing red. But perhaps if that didn't happen, maybe he would have been able to let it go. But okay. yeah. So then he begins to chase down Jesus and Aurora to the building's rooftop, um, and they're. It's kind of ridiculous. Like they they go up to like this big sign that's De La Guardia on top of the building, and it's neon lit and all. It looks great, but it's the most impractical spot to run to like to be safe i don't know right. <laughs> but it's great it looks great though and um so they they're fighting actually there's not really fighting on is just whooping the shit out of uh, uh jesus with this bar that he got off a wall and then um he goes to like start to chase after aurora who's kind of climbed her way down and um angel and him were both like l- smiling at each other these great like smiles like they're like warriors battling and they know like this is the last of it. And then um, uh, Jesus distracts him for a minute by looking down. And once his uh, Angel looks down, Jesus charges at him and grabs him and they uh, jump off of this electronic sign and they go down the, uh, to the, this window that was, I don't know uh, what they call like sunroofs skylight. or whatever skylight yes exactly yeah. thank you and they crash through the skylight and he makes sure to put on him in between him and the floor <laughs> so he can lay so he can land on him because he says for me i don't have a lot on the line like for me it's just pain meaning yeah. for you it's gonna be your life and so that's what happens he ends up killing he ends up killing on him that way so uh, so they're both on the floor in pain. And I think Jesus might even be dead here. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you thought of it. But I think uh, you're right, because I think it took Aurora, because, you know, where it took him so long to come back before, there was like a three-day break or something between when he died falling off the cliff and when he came back in the funeral home. Um, but where Aurora puts the uh, Kronos device on his chest where it can get directly to his heart after he's fallen, I think that, speeds up the process of him coming back 
Okay, I think so. Yeah, you're right. So then Aurora runs to the ground and places the Kronos on her grandfather, and he comes back to life. And she has somehow gotten blood on her. Maybe she's cut herself from the glasses on the floor. And she has this blood on her hands and she's like, like putting it up to her mouth. And Jesus like sees the blood and goes into like this animal instinct and is like fighting against it. And um, like he's closing his eyes trying to fight. And then she says, abuelo, which means grandfather in Spanish. And he like, closes his eyes and finally like gets the strength to like, he says, no. And he, he backs away and he doesn't bite her and doesn't take her blood. And then he takes the Kronos and puts it on a platform and takes a rock and just smashes it and just completely destroys it. And he says, yo soy Jesus Gris, which he's saying, I am Jesus Gris, which um, maybe helps him to feel better about, his situation like he yes he's going through some crazy ass thing right now but he's still the man that he was he's still the grandfather to this little girl yeah yeah Re reclaiming his identity yeah um so then jesus is then seen in his bed at home and aurora lays with her uh lays her head upon her grandfather's skin which has become that same marble white color as the alchemist at the beginning of the film uh, then we see the sunshine gleaming through the window as Mercedes comes to her husband, embracing his hand as the camera fades to black. It also says in memory of or dedicated to Josefina Camberos, and that was Guillermo del Toro's grandmother. And he said in interviews that he had a similar relationship that Aurora does with Jesus that he had with his grandmother, where they were, oh, they were very close. That's yeah. So that's a that's a beautiful tribute. I always wonder about that when they, you know, when they dedicate a movie to somebody like that. I'm always kind of interested in who, you know, and who it is and what the relationship was. Yeah, I thought it was just a beautiful ending to a beautiful movie and it it, it was yes, it was a horror movie and yes, it was about vampires if you want to label it, but but honestly, it's really just like this story of this grandfather, this relationship between a grandfather and uh granddaughter and what th this these circumstances that led to this happening will now where now she has to grow up in perhaps an unloving home right because they're they're traumatized by this this thing that happened to them to, to their husband and to their grandfather and i maybe maybe it'll bring them closer but quite possibly it'll tear them apart you know tear them apart even further than they already are and it's just just a really sad ending. Yeah. In, and I guess I didn't think about that uh, as far as, you know, them, them remaining farther apart. I sort of wondered whether they're bringing all three of them together at the end. Um, I got the feeling that some of the animosity or underlying issues between the two female characters was a little bit of jealousy back and forth. Like obviously not sexual jealousy, that wasn't the thing, but it was more like an attention thing, you know, like you sort of got the impression sometimes that Mercedes was frustrated because of all the attention and time that was lavished on this child as opposed to her. Um, and, you know, once she starts getting it back some during the New, York, the New Year's party, you can see Aurora being a little bit pissed off about that, you know, because all that attention was being lavished on, on Mercedes. And it made me wonder if the way that they gathered like that at the end, whether with him sort of just physically bringing them together and then passing whether without the need for that jealousy, whether they might be able to sort of see, I, I must always go for like the happy endings. Like, see, I should have stayed their <laughs> friend and you know, he'd have been fine. He could just be like a marble dude, but they could just keep the lights off and you know, but, I, but I like what you're saying that, uh, with Mercedes coming to join, Jesus and Aurora at his bedside. Maybe that is him joining them together and they can get closer through his death. And that's, that's a great, that's a great way to look at it. I was being more pessimistic, but that's a really optimistic way to look at it. And I think there's, there's, um, it could be either or. Yeah, it could. I was, I loved, I loved the way that they portrayed the relationship, the husband and wife relationship there though, because 
you know, like you mentioned initially when we meet Mercedes, it, it's looking like, does she have, you know, is she cheating? Does she have this other love interest in the form of this guy, you know, her dance student. Um, and they, to, for that, and one of the things that I really love, like I'm a sucker for romance anyway. I love romance and I love meet cutes and I love happy lay of after, but I'm always more interested in like the long-term love. You know, like what does romance look like when you've been married for 25 years or 30 years or 50 years? What does it look like during the years when you have small children? Like, you know, it's anybody can fall in love, but how does it look to stay in love? And in instances like this, to to find each other again, to rekindle that. I always think that's to me, it's it's a much more interesting presentation um, because, yeah, I mean, in my in my opinion, you know, marriages are long term relationships. It's it's about choosing over and over and over to stay in that relationship and to stay married, you know, because you can turn away from each other at any time and it's a choice to turn towards each other. And I liked watching that. And again, Del Toro never beats us over the head with these relationships. No one says these things overtly. It's all in small gestures and expressions and, and that sort of thing. And it just it makes it so effective. Yeah, you're right. He doesn't, especially the morning after when he shaved his mustache to look younger. He like says, do you like it or not? She says, I do like it. And then he's like, okay, good. And then Billy playfully. And then he walks away and like, she starts giggling like a schoolgirl or something like somebody who's just like, you know, this is their first date or something like that. She's like, Oh, like she's, it's just, I love the love that she had for him in her eyes, you know, and, and him for her. So, uh, so I wanted to talk a bit about some of the themes that, that were in this movie. One of the themes I saw was like time, right? Because it's kind of like the, the uh, alchemist is in the what the fifteenth or the sixteenth century, and then he comes into the twentieth century. But also, there's in that in that um, New Year's Eve party, there's a guy literally dressed as a clock, yeah, representing time. And then in, in the final fight with the neon sign where it says De La Guardia, there's actually a neon clock there as well. Oh, I miss that. I miss yeah. the neon clock. Yeah, so so it's like when you're a vampire, you live forever. So clocks don't mean anything to you. So, you know, I, I was trying to figure out what Guillermo del Toro was saying there, or if maybe it's just symbolism of all these clocks throughout, you know. I, I just thought, I thought that was cool how he kept that going throughout the movie. Yeah, yeah. And I, I read something because I was reading the, like, the little, you know, like trivia notes and stuff on IMDb after the facts. And it was like one of them was that the clock – that the the suit that the guy was wearing like the time it was clearly like working like you can see the second hand like moving oh, really? but it's but the time i think was still stopped at one particular spot and i thought that was interesting um but yeah and i think you know as far as like the time goes i think them addressing it in a few small ways like on hell saying you know like why would you want more of this crappy life that you don't even use you know, and Jesus never asked for this extension of life. He would much rather have had his natural, um, you know, the natural years that were left to him. Yeah. Rather than he, trying to extend it beyond the lives of his family, of his loved ones. And he was actually like the embodiment of like, if you, I forget what the term is, but like thinking young is staying young. So like mm -hmm. he played with his granddaughter, he did puzzles with his granddaughter and he was doing hopscotch uh, yeah. on the floor, you know, with his granddaughter. So he was staying young and staying active. He doesn't need this, like the, the, the Kronos device to be young. He, he was young in his mind and he's young in his, in his heart. And so uh, also um, when we're talking about time, like Angel was biding his time waiting for his uncle to die so that he can inherit his fortune. And so, yeah, it, there's different aspects of time that, that Guillermo del Toro like weaves throughout the story in the plot. And I just, I thought that's it was masterful. Great, that's a great point. I would have missed that. I think completely even with that there. So that's a really great point. I like that. Yeah. Another one, uh, another theme that I picked up on or I read about was monsters. Guillermo del Toro has monsters in almost all of his movies. Probably I think all of them. He's famous for them, right? But in this one, um, we're questioning, the, like, the outward appearance of Jesus is very monsterish. But inside, he's still the same loving grandfather and husband that he was. Whereas we have the La Guardia and Angel, 
who look and appear human and quote unquote normal, but they're the actual monsters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so he's playing the, the two against each other. And I just, it's masterful. Uh, and something that I didn't pick up on immediately. Uh, I was reading up on it, but uh, you know, it's, it's something like uh, it's a vampire movie mixed with like a vamp, uh, a Frankenstein movie. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It is because it's, you know, it's it's not the man who is through no fault of his own turned into like a physical monster who's the real threat, you know, because even I thought it was interesting, even so like in the bathroom, in that completely disgusting bathroom scene where he's so focused on that blood, like he's followed this man with a nosebleed all the way through this crowd up here. He doesn't ever seem to consider like taking it directly from the man. He does not you know, seem to think like, oh, maybe I'll just take it right from your face. He just, he waits, you know, for the guy to leave. So it's very passive. It's not, um, it's not really threatening at all. And I I feel as though he probably would have continued along in that same line, you know, had his, had his uh, quote unquote life not been prematurely ended by on hell. Yeah. Yeah, that would have been nice to see where, where if he could have lived and just sustain his this new vampire lifestyle in 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 a, a way where he's like robbing blood banks or something, yeah. or just you know, <laughs> maybe he becomes a crime fighting grandpa vampire and like there takes some blood from criminals or something. Who knows? Or just does crime scene cleanup, right? <laughs> like because yeah. that's he could do that at any hour. You know, he he wouldn't have to deal with the sun. He could just go in there at two a.m. Yeah, that's true. God damn, that's a, a, a story that needs to be written. <laughs> <laughs> CSI cleanup vampires. <laughs> so that was Kronos. What did you think of the movie? I, I loved it. Um, I think it's one that I would definitely revisit because uh, there was so much. I mean, setting aside any of the other like awesome things that we've talked about, you know, uh, Del Toro's skill in the pacing and the relationship creation, and and just how he is so subtle, you know, with things that are so effective. It's a visually very appealing movie. Um, the Chronos device itself is beautiful. It's golden and it's clockwork. Um, and I loved that there were a couple scenes where we saw inside the device, right? Like. Like this bug, you know, and I love oh, the way. Oh yeah, that we didn't they, even talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, and I love the way that they explained. Like he said, he was like, you know, the bug acts like a filter, right? Like it's like it filters the blood through the bug itself, which then, you know, when it comes, you know, when when it reenters the bloodstream, I guess it's it's got this different quality to it, and um, somehow that we managed to see inside this Chronos device without it seem ridiculous. You know, like, like some movies, you know, if you see, if they show you inside like a small like area, it just looks, it looks silly because they've tried to, you know, recreate what is supposed to be a small area in a larger Mm -hmm. one. But the way it's shot, the way it's so limited and kind of crowded in there and we see the clockworks and, and gears and everything moving. um, And then, you know, he just doesn't linger on it enough to make it silly. Um, And it's just this really visually appealing look into what's actually going on in the device. And it also helps that he has the bug, maybe it's a scarab, I don't know what it is, but he has it in there. And so we can tell by the size of that bug, how big everything else is. Yeah. 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 So it's great. That's a good point too. Yeah. So what we do now here is we rate the movie based on five upside down crosses. So I know they change depending on the day you've seen it and the, the mood you're in and, uh, so the people you watch it with, I'm just asking for today or, or when you saw it, what you what you would give this movie out of five upside down crosses. I think I would have to give it five because there was um, there was so much to appreciate and there was nothing that I could think of that is like, ah, this took me out of it or, oh, I wish they'd gone this way or they didn't really earn this reaction. Like, I just I feel like. I don't want to say it's totally flawless, but certainly for 1993, which with, with, with what was available for special effects and things like that, um, I think it was incredibly effective. I, I would give it all five upside down crosses. Nice. Yeah. And I would agree, especially on the budget they had. And, and um, Ron Perlman actually took a pay cut, a huge pay cut because uh, they went over budget and they, they needed it to come out of somewhere. 
And so Guillermo del Toro was so appreciative of that, that he's cast him in many of his movies after that. So that's what th- this movie started their relationship, th- their 30 year relationship, making movies together with, which I thought was I beautiful. Know that. That's, a, that's amazing. Oh, Ron Perlman. <laughs> yeah. He's a good guy. So um, I think I would agree with you. Well, I would, let me see. Let me back up that a little bit. It's a great movie. I love the movie. Uh, I love everything that Guillermo del Toro did with it. I'm not sure I can give it five, but I, I would definitely give it between four and four and a half. And I would probably give it, I think I would give it four and a half. The, just the relationship that grandfather and the, and the granddaughter had, uh, Jesus and Aurora. It's such a beautiful take on it. And um, the, the if I had known, like if I'd gone, if, if, if Guillermo del Toro himself hadn't ruined it for me <laughs> and I, and I went into this knowing that, or not knowing that it was a vampire movie, I would have been blown away. I'm like, holy shit. But even even then, still the way they went about it was just great. I really appreciate it. So I, I probably, I'll give it four and a half. Uh, I really loved it. All right, Laurel. So uh, in order to be fully absolved of your horror movie scene, I'll be recommending to you three movies for uh, for you to watch. Uh, and then if you can watch those movies, uh, you can watch those movies and uh, hopefully come back on and we can discuss them in the future and in another movie. So the first movie I'd recommend to you is another Guillermo del Toro movie. In fact, I think it was the second movie it came out in 97 called Mimic. And this is also a bug movie. Right. Or, Good yeah, theme. It's about like, Good theme. Yeah. And then uh, there's The Hunger uh, from 1983 starring David Bowie and Catherine Deneuve. It's a really excellent movie. Uh, this is also a, a vampire movie. And then The Transfiguration. Uh, that's from 2016. And this one kind of leaves it up in the air whether or not it's a vampire movie or not. So, hmm, okay. so I think you got a good mix of movies there. I think you're going to really <laughs> enjoy all of those. But, but you know, seeing as how you only get one one hour a week on TV, you'll probably get done with this in about you know six weeks or so or a month. Two <laughs> that's months. A, that's about right. Yeah, yeah, pretty accurate. That's going to be the easiest absolution ever. I like. That. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Laura. Well, I appreciate you coming on to this uh, to the podcast. It's been so much fun. Um, if you could please let my audience know where they can follow you, how they can support you, where they can buy your books, all that sort of stuff. Okay, great. Yeah. Th- thank you for having me on. This is this is awesome. And I loved getting a chance to watch Kronos. Um, I am on Twitter to a detrimental degree. So you can always follow me there at Hightower Laurel. Um, and uh, my website is www.laurelhightower.com. It is woefully out of date, but the message uh, <laughs> function still works. <laughs> Um, and otherwise I'm on Instagram sometimes, but I'm really, really bad at it. So yeah, tw- Twitter's, Twitter's kind of the best way. And, um, I think right now below is only available for pre-order through, uh, the ghoulish books or perpetual motion machine publishing website. I don't think the pre-orders are up yet on any of the other, um, venues, uh, but crossroads and whispers in the dark are available through pretty much anywhere you can buy books. Nice. And if you'd like to follow me, you can follow me on Twitter at MHCPod. You can follow me on Instagram at MyHorrorConfessional. If you'd like to email the show, you can email me at MyHorrorConfessional at gmail.com. The music you heard was by Taylor Fox. You can follow her on Instagram at the Taylor Fox. She's going to be dropping uh, an album from her band, Great Hag, pretty soon. So listen for that. And the artwork was done by my friend, Cap Mikey. You can follow him on Instagram at Captain underscore Mikey underscore art. That's it for this week. We'll talk to you next week. Yeah.